Hi, I'm Kate. Welcome to the Smith & Nephew Wound Club online module on pressure ulcers, which forms part of a series of modules you can access to develop your knowledge and understanding around wound care. Today, we're discussing pressure ulcers. In clinical practice, you will come across the terms pressure injuries and pressure ulcers, and these can be used interchangeably. However, for the purpose of this presentation, we will use the term pressure ulcer. After completing this, you will know what defines a wound as a pressure ulcer, what influencing risk factors there are, and how pressure ulcers are graded in terms of severity according to the level of tissue damage involved. Firstly, let's look at the burden of pressure ulcers. Pressure ulcers are a major burden of sickness and reduced quality of life for people and their caregivers. They are estimated to occur in four to 10% of patients admitted to hospitals in the UK, and they can be debilitating for the patient, especially those over the age of 75. Pressure ulcers can also lead to life-threatening complications such as sepsis or gangrene, severely affecting the patient's quality of life. There is currently no nationally collated data on pressure ulcer incidence and prevalence, with hospital-based studies varying widely according to definitions used, the population studied and the care setting. Therefore, I'm sure you can agree that recognising and understanding more around pressure ulcers will help to improve outcomes for patients. It's important to understand what defines an ulcer as pressure related, as correctly diagnosing the cause of any wound is important in the assessment and appropriate planning to facilitate wound healing. Remember that if a wound is not caused by pressure, it should not be documented as a pressure ulcer. Therefore, a pressure ulcer is defined as localised damage to the skin and or the underlying tissue. The ulcer is usually over a bony prominence, for example, heels or elbows. There may be associated pain with the ulcer. The overarching cause will be as a result of intense or prolonged pressure to the area and can be in combination with a shearing force. Let's consider the factors contributing to pressure ulcer development, which are pressure, friction and shear. Humidity and temperature are not direct causes of pressure injuries. However, they are exacerbating factors. Moisture and temperature can weaken the skin and also increase the risk of friction and shearing of superficial tissue, whereas very dry skin becomes brittle and has increased risk for fissures or cracks. Pressure is defined as a force perpendicular to the skin. It results in tissue deformation and associated damage. The stress and strain within the tissue leads to cell death, which creates an inflammatory response, ultimately resulting in inflammatory edema and further increasing the mechanical loads on cells and tissues due to a rise in interstitial pressures. Cell and tissue damage may occur quickly. Lastly, Pressure occludes vascular and lymphatic vessels, leading to ischemia and decreased waste elimination, which further contributes to inflammation. Shear is a force parallel to the skin, which causes one layer of the body tissue to move in relation to others and is believed to play a role in deep tissue pressure injury. A slight lateral movement of only half a centimetre can significantly increase force at the bone muscle interface. Muscle tissues are not as stiff as the skin and are more easily damaged. So what about friction? Friction is resistance to parallel motion. Friction may occur from rubbing of the skin against a surface, other body parts, or from a care provider when repositioning the patient Friction results in an abrasive injury and may contribute to the skin tears among those at risk. Friction alone is not a factor in pressure injuries. However, friction plus gravity results in shear and that does contribute to the development of pressure ulcers. It is important to mention there is also a risk of pressure ulcers from medical devices. Some of the most common medical devices which result in pressure ulcers are listed here. 
there are also numerous patient-related factors that influence the risk of developing a pressure ulcer. For example, patient age and mobility restriction. Due to the nature of pressure ulcers being multifaceted, a comprehensive holistic assessment is vital for any patient with this type of injury to ensure wound healing is optimised. It's useful to acknowledge these factors so we're able to identify which patients are at a greater risk of pressure ulcer development. Let's go through the pressure ulcer classification system. The pressure ulcer classification system was developed specifically for pressure injuries and describes the depth of tissue damage visible. Therefore, pressure ulcers that are completely covered with necrotic or non-viable tissue would be classified as unstageable. Reverse staging should not be used to describe healing pressure ulcers or injuries. When we think about it, this makes sense. The body is unable to regenerate certain tissues such as fat, fascia and muscle. Therefore, reverse staging is inaccurate when used as a parameter for wound healing. Most wounds, such as burns, traumatic injuries, the arterial and venous ulcers are described as partial thickness or full thickness, depending upon the tissues involved. Partial thickness wounds involve the epidermis and the dermis. Full thickness wounds involve the subcutaneous fat, fascia, muscles and or bone. Neuropathic or diabetic foot ulcers have a separate classification system, which include partial and full thickness in the descriptions. Pressure ulcers are categorised according to a classification system. In this table, you can see that category one and two pressure ulcers represent partial thickness tissue damage, whereas category three, four, unstageable and deep tissue injuries or DTIs represent full thickness tissue damage. It's important to remember that the tissue involvement is not necessarily an indicator of wound depth. For example, a shallow wound over the malleolus may have exposed bone. Category one pressure ulcers are those with the skin remaining intact. They're characterized by an area of local non-blanching erythema. It's worth noting that on darkly pigmented skin, this may appear differently. There may also be changes in sensation or temperature or the firmness of the skin. Category two pressure ulcers are classified as having partial thickness loss of skin where the dermis is exposed. This means that the wound bed is exposed and may appear as pink or red and often following the breakdown or rupture of a blister. It's important to note that there will be no deeper tissue involvement at this stage and that the wound bed will be free of slough and eschar. Sometimes stage two pressure ulcers can be confused with moisture associated skin damage. Therefore, understanding the cause, as we mentioned before, is really important. There are separate staging and classification terms for moisture associated skin damage, which will be covered in a future Wound Club Online module. Category three pressure ulcers are defined as those with full thickness loss of skin. Adipose or fatty tissue is visible, often with the presence of granulation, slough and or eschar in the wound bed. There may be the presence of undermining or tunneling, however, Muscle, tendon or bone is not exposed. Category four pressure ulcers are classified as full thickness skin and tissue loss with visible bone, muscle or tendon. There may also be slough and eschar present and undermining or tunneling is common. As mentioned previously, unstageable pressure ulcers are those with full thickness skin and tissue loss in which the extent of tissue damage cannot be fully assessed as the presence of slough or eschar is covering the extent of tissue damage. Once the slough and eschar have been removed, the pressure ulcer can and should be classified correctly. Deep tissue injury or DTI is a term used to describe a unique form of pressure ulcers. 
These ulcers have been described by clinicians for many years with terms such as purple pressure ulcers, ulcers that are likely to deteriorate and bruises on bony prominences. By definition, they are a pressure related injury to subcutaneous tissues under intact skin. Initially, these injuries have the appearance of a deep bruise. They may lead to the development of a category three or four pressure ulcer. Medical device related pressure ulcers result from the use of devices designed and applied for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. For example, urinary catheters or nasal cannula to provide oxygen therapy. They often present in the same shape or pattern as the device. Any injury incurred should be classified in the normal way with the cause of the ulcer documented. To check your knowledge and understanding, try and answer the quiz questions. Well done, you're now at the end of the module. Take the time to reflect on how you will take some of what you've learned and apply it to your daily practice. It might be useful to think of some patients in your care and reflect on their skincare and how you might manage this moving forward. If you're on the NMC register, please click on the link shown to access a copy of the revalidation form. Thank you for your time today and please remember to look at the other sections of the Smith & Nephew channel to access additional modules to help you on your learning journey. Thank you. Thank you.